When picking out a movie, you almost always have a rough idea of what it's going to entail. You know if you're watching a gooey love story in a rom-com, for example, it'll be tied up with a happy ending. Or that you'll be regaled with supernatural jump scares in a horror, or just get a messy joyride of whatever he deems as acting at the time in a Nick Cage film. But then sometimes, in a self-aware flex that snaps audiences out of their expectation stupor, a movie scene plays out that changes our perception of the whole thing entirely. Whether it flips a movie into a new and unexpected genre out of left field, adds an entirely different context to character arcs and decisions, or strikes a devastating blow that means you can never watch the damn thing in the same way again knowing what's coming. Filmmakers love to throw curveballs that leave audiences reeling. Some are subtle, and some are not. But all of these scenes deliver that same base-level what the fuckery that transforms the film we signed up for into something else altogether. I am the rewritten history of Ash from What Culture, and these are eight movie scenes that completely changed their film. The Abduction Fire in the Sky Nothing quite embodies the whole movie scene out of nowhere gimmick like Fire in the Sky. What begins as a biopic about a missing man whose friend's claim has been abducted by aliens carefully pans out into a slow burning, ambiguous drama, pitting logical police officers that doubt the extraterrestrial story against a group of frightened loggers that miraculously pass lie detector tests with their far fetched tale. Of course, all disbelief about the man's plight for the audience is blown away when Walton suffers a flashback in the middle of his welcome home party, revealing in grisly detail exactly what happens when one is abducted and experimented upon by dour-faced aliens. With one switch of the narrative, we are plunged into a graphic horror film that isn't afraid to step into full-blown nightmare territory, as Walton is shrink-wrapped, poked full of holes, and has a rudimentary hose shoved down his throat, before being flung back to Earth and questioned some more by doubtful law enforcement. It's as traumatizing for the audience as it is for Walton, and casts the whole movie in a new and unforgettable light once it's played out. I'm not strong enough. The Incredibles Pixar are known for pulling the rug out on audiences in the most emotionally crippling ways possible. You only have to watch the opening 10 minutes of Up to get a feel for how adept the studio has become at sucker-punching audiences, delivering scenes that instantaneously crumble the world they've established with just a moment of devastating character work. And unsurprisingly, The Incredibles is no different. Mr. Incredible's whole arc throughout the movie has been something of an ego boost, returning to his superhero work to feel important again after years spent stuck in a monotonous day job. When it comes to supervillain Syndrome's evil robot about to take down the city, Mr. Incredible attempts to leave his family behind in what appears to be another empty gesture of masculinity. That is, until Elastigirl's questioning reveals his incessant need to prove his strength is to reaffirm to himself that he can protect his family, rather than for his own pride, as he doesn't know how he would cope without them. It's a touching moment that spins Mr. Incredible's whole character arc into a new and sentimental light, giving reason for some of his more questionable decisions throughout. Title Fight – Million Dollar Baby Million Dollar Baby is a unique case that fits his whole premise rather well. Simply as in one sweeping moment, the film is changed from classic sports movie into a dramatic, touching reflection on life and how we perceive it. The film is one that capitalized on its marketing as an underdog story, one that sees young woman Maggie trained up as a boxer under the instruction of veteran trainer Frankie, right up until the biggest match of their partnership that turns everything on its head. I mean, quite literally, in fact, as Maggie takes a hard fall that sees her break her neck on an unfortunately placed stool and become a respirator-reliant quadriplegic. Her injuries result in her asking Frankie to help take her life, ending on a far more dour note than the boxing beat-em-up movie that Million Dollar Baby was billed as. Instead of sports drama and overcoming the odds, the film subverts all expectation and goes in completely the opposite direction with one swift scene, one that plays on the unfairness of the game as well as life in one nasty sucker punch. Leslie's gone forever. Bridge to Terabithia Children's movies are supposed to be nice. They're supposed to capture your imagination, provide some good, wholesome fun, and maybe teach a little moral lesson or two. But ultimately, they're there to give that warm, fuzzy feeling that comes with the nostalgia of being young. Bridge to Terabithia succeeds in all of those ways and more, telling the tale of two outcast children, Jess and Leslie, that then band together to create their own imaginary kingdom in the nearby woods where they can ignore the hardships of their lives. 
Then one day, it just all ends. Completely out of nowhere, Leslie dies a tragic death at the bottom of a creek, drowning when the rope swing the pair used to enter Terabithia snaps and a very real fate consumes her. Jess was away on a trip with his teacher, deciding not to invite Leslie at the last moment and is consumed by guilt thereafter. Whilst the ending is a bittersweet one where Jess overcomes his emotions and bonds with his sister, the absolute gut-wrenching reveal and subsequent empty space where Leslie should be is hard to get over and paints the entire movie in a dark new light. Children's film, not anymore, returning to the airport, Lady Bird. Part of the new breed of coming-of-age movies, Lady Bird is a touching, sentimental look at one girl growing up and preparing for college, clashing with her mother the entire time in the way that only teenage girls can. Christine, aka the self-titled Lady Bird, spends the entire movie in an up-and-down relationship with her mother, Marion, who is just like her. Marion in particular is disdainful of Lady Bird's desire to attend a big city university, constantly telling her daughter she's not smart or rich enough to make anything of herself outside of the state. As the film culminates, Lady Bird manages to secure a place in New York, though, resulting in Marion not talking to her for the rest of the summer and giving her an icy drop-off at the airport. Laurie Metcalf then acts her socks off in showing Marion's overwhelming flood of emotions at her daughter leaving, changing her mind to come back and say goodbye but finding Lady Bird already gone. It is small, poignant and in keeping with the rest of the movie, but it is the one moment that really gives away just how much Marion cares for her daughter no matter how hard she has been on Earth throughout the rest of their journey. It's the linchpin that makes the film as sentimental as it is now regarded. The Hunchback Kill List Another scene that comes completely out of left field when considering the careful tone the rest of the movie establishes, Kill List begins with a contract killer getting back into work with his partner after a botched job many months ago. While strange occult happenings crop up throughout the narrative, it plays particularly straight for the most part, establishing Jay and Gal as methodical, professional, and murderous in every capacity. And then, it all turns on its head. After killing two of their intended targets, only one remains. But he is far different from the other perps they have been chasing. They find him in the middle of a sacrificial ritual that then gets Jay involved, dressing him up in a strange wicker mask and forcing him to fight a hunchback that turns out to be his wife and child under a sheet that he has unwittingly murdered. Nothing is explained and nothing quite prepares an audience for the weird, horrific turn the film takes into occult practice. Quite what it all means is anybody's guess, but instead of a buddy killer action drama movie, we get a far darker take instead. Vampire Showdown From Dust Till Dawn from Dust Till Dawn's movie-defining scene comes in the infamous Titty Twister Bar, a film that starts out as an intense, brooding action movie with two dangerous brothers on the run. From Dust Till Dawn throws its serious premise out the window as soon as its protagonists hit the Mexican border. There, they take refuge in a strip club where things start to get a little heated, before the whole damn place explodes into a showdown between human patrons and a whole room of vampires. Wait, what? Vampires? In one swift scene, the place transforms from biker gang clubhouse into blood-sucking nightmare, replete with crotch guns, topless monsters, and your fair helping of fanged freaks. It is a complete change of tone as it barrels into horror comedy straight out of its brooding thriller roots, throwing everything it had built up so far out of the window for some ridiculously dumb entertainment. It is two movies welded together by nothing more than Quentin Tarantino's love of sucking feet. Of course, it is a bit of a shock for the uninitiated, but it works completely well as something entirely unexpected, and it means you can never watch it in the same way ever again. The Tattoo – Harold and Maud Harold and Maud is a black comedy that sees a young man obsessed with death, fervently interested in both faking the end of his life as well as all the different methods that go into such an act, much to the upset of his immediate family members. Understandably, really. He eventually meets Maud, a 79-year-old woman whose mantra of living life to the fullest comes alongside a carefree attitude to death, too. It's one that draws Harold in as the pair form an unlikely friendship, and later on a relationship as they become romantically entwined, much to the upset of his immediate family members yet again. And yet again, understandably, really, since he is only 18 years old himself. And whilst the strange duo's infatuation with death might raise eyebrows, their separate reasoning is heartbreakingly tragic. Whilst Harold's is explored as the film unfolds, Maud's is never explicitly mentioned. It's only one brief, easy-to-miss scene that reveals her influential past that instantly adds a whole new context and meaning to a celebration of every day of life. 
Maud has a Nazi concentration camp tattoo on her arm, marking her as a Holocaust survivor. And that's our list. What other scenes do a complete 180 on their movies? Share your thoughts in the comment section below. I've been Ash and this has been What Culture. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and come back again soon for more lovely film content. Thanks for watching.